friends, and welcome to Salva School Study, where we examine the Word of God together and where we ask God to bless us in our study. I'm your host, Jamal Thomas, and today I have again with me a very special guest. I'm going to let him introduce himself to you. Hi, everybody. Sorry, boss. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Dean Yearwood. I'm here with you once again. Thanks for the invite, Jamal. Sure, no problem. My pleasure. And tonight, we're reviewing lesson number eight, which is entitled Covenant Law. And just to remind everyone at home, we're looking at the promise, God's everlasting covenant. Mm -hmm. And just to remind us all, God wants to be in a covenant relationship with you. And just keep this in your mind as we ask Dean, Pastor Dean, to pray for us as we open our study. Sure. Let's bore our heads. Our Father, we start in heaven. We thank you for the opportunity to be here and study once more. I pray that uh, as we are delving into your word, that your spirit will indeed lead us in tr into truth and that we will learn something more about you. Thank you for the opportunity. For Christ's sake. Amen. 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 Covenant law. I, f I feel, wait, Ken, Ken, hold a minute. I, I feel confused. Are we doing number eight? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. Why it looks, oh, because I, sorry, sorry. <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm not confused anymore. I know why it looks different now. I wasn't using my tablet and, right. <laughs> I apologize. I told you, I'm sleeping. So you want, you want me to open the intro one time and then? Yeah, so. Hello? He just saying that to make me not feel sporty. Yeah, Dean had a little, Dean had a little blip as well, so don't worry. Oh, okay. said, sorry, boss. It is all right. All right. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, restart my call. <clears throat> yeah, give me a call again, let me go. Wake up. All right. In five, four, three, two. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sabbath School Study, where we enter the Word of God and we enjoy our study together. I'm your host, Jamal Faunas, and tonight we have a very special guest with us again in the studio, my friend, your pastor. Let's hear who he is. Hi, my name is Dean. It's good to see you once more. We're here to study God's Word. Amen. Amen. And yes, of course, tonight we're looking still again back into the Word of God together, the promise, God's everlasting covenant. We're looking at lesson number eight this week, which is entitled Covenant Law. That's right. I'm just going to ask uh, Dean to pray for us so that we can enter into the Word of God together and to bring this study close to our hearts and into our minds. Sure. Let's bow our heads. Our Father, child in heaven, we want to thank you for bringing us to another study. Even now, as we go into your word, my prayer, our prayer, would be that your spirit will indeed guide us into all truth. Even now, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word and to have just a short discussion for these next few moments. For Christ's sake, amen. 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 The covenant law. So, the memory text for this week is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. Mm -hmm. uh, Dean, would you mind reading this one for us here? Yeah, sure. Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, taken from the New King James Version. It says, Therefore, know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandments. Mm. You know, in the word of God, uh, he says to us that God, he leads me into the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Mm -hmm. He is the one that leads me into the pathways of righteousness for his name's sake. I'm happy that he does this. But have you ever asked yourself how exactly it is that he teaches us what the right paths are and how he can point us onto these paths? Well, this week we're going to understand in fact, just to quote another psalm for you, just to give away to under, help us to understand, Psalm chapter 119, uh, verse 172 says, 
all thy commandments are righteousness. That's right. All thy commandments are righteousness. And so, uh, when it comes to the election of Israel, when it comes to the election of Israel, we've been learning so many different things uh, this week. And one of the things that we are going to be learning about is election. So, talk to me, uh, Dean. What are they talking about here? Is, is God holding a vote? Did Israel win a vote? <laughs> uh, did he have a popularity contest or something? How, what, what exactly is this idea about election? And more importantly, how does it benefit the church today? Well, well election... As most people know, when they talk about elections, they talk about politics or whatever. Um, that is defined basically as a formal or organized choice uh, by vote of a person for a political office or anything. That is the the <laughs> the government version of election. So right? what? Okay. But but when they see election for a spiritual sense, it gives me the idea that a person now is accepting a call after God has basically called them and they are making their election sure. All right. Um, if we could go on a little further and talking yeah. about Israel, since they're talking about the election of Israel, it is not that Israel had a, an advantage over anybody, not that Israel was, uh, you know, had, had this particular thing about them that was much different, you know, but it's that God had called them through, if you remember the lessons leading up to today or this week, through Abraham and decisions that were made and choices that were given and calls that were sent and answered. So here we are now, past Abraham and looking about his descendants, Israel. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like I like what you said. And I let me just make reference to the verse here, Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse seven. I'm reading from the King James Version, mm -hmm. and it says, "The Lord did not set His love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number mm -hmm. than any people." For you were the fewest of all people. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at this and thinking to myself, God didn't choose them because he wanted to, because they had some kind of high privilege or they were, you know, a big country or really obedient. In fact, I'm getting the idea that it had to do more with God's love and his grace and just because mm -hmm. of who God is that That's he true. chose them. So then I guess a better question would be then, since they were chosen by God, what were they chosen for? What did he want to accomplish through them? So remember that the, the, through Abraham, that he was given a promise that, that, uh, that, that, that a savior will come through his seed. We, we, we just condensing all the lessons that came before to answer this one question, right? And, and their, through, through their descendants now would be the savior of the world. You know, the one that we call Jesus now, uh, and we are worshiping him because he has come to this point. And this promise, as they refer to them, has come from them, that decision even from the foundation of the world. Interest is seen. We seeing it uh, being even, I want to say, cemented, cemented in their generational link coming down. Word of that, taught, uh, taught by word, taught by action, taught by the, the example that Abraham and other stalwarts of faith had been living and teaching. You know, here we see it coming up again in the, the calling of Israel, or rather, the exposing of Israel to who God was. Ah, uh, the ex, the ex, they're, God is using them mm -hmm. to show everybody <clears throat> who he is. Mm -hmm. And then like that, and I suppose that's what this text is talking about here. Um, Exodus chapter 19 and verse 6. Uh, he, God says, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests mm -hmm. and a holy nation. These are the words which you should speak unto the children of Israel. And if they are going to be a, an entire kingdom of priests, then it means that everybody else in the world, um, might be their parishioners, so to speak, <laughs> that they are communicating something that God wanted to show them. And as you said, it has to do with the fact that he wanted to highlight the kind of God who he is. So just to be clear, uh, yes or no, is, are they the only ones who will be reading? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. I did the only ones that are reading. No, 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 no. No, the resounding no. I was, so, leave, I was leaving some room for the viewers at home to answer. <laughs> I, 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 I answered too quick into the letter stand and answer on their, on their own before I, I shared my head. But yeah, they're not the only ones. Exactly. And this is this is all I wanted to highlight here. So uh, God wasn't, wasn't making some kind of special exclusive club. I don't need to be a new... Mm -hmm. uh, Asian nation of Israel, I don't need to be black, I don't need to be a man, mm -hmm. I don't need to be a priest or a pastor, no. He just wanted to use them to communicate 
uh, to the world, as you said before, who mm -hmm. he is. And I suppose by extension, the church today, everybody who is called by God's name today has that same mission. Mm -hmm. And so talk to me about the ties that bind now. Um, according to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 13, which says, and he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even 10 commandments. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone. So I'm asking the question here now, uh, what, what, is it, what is the relationship between the covenant and the law? Um, the, the, the word that you ask in the question is also the answer. Okay. Between the covenant and the law is the relationship. I'm mm -hmm. going to be talking about the ties that bind it. We, we cannot separate it from God's character and we cannot separate it from, from, from what God will ask us to do. Uh, he, 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 through asking us, we follow the law, uh, as this text you just read there from uh, Deuteronomy 4.13. He, he did say the Ten Commandments that he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And, and even 10.13, it says that to keep the commandments of the Lord and the statutes which I command for you today for your good. So we see now that the, 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 the to have this relationship with God, it is in our best interest to follow the commands of God. In this instance, he's referring to, to the Ten Commandments. Mm. Very important. Very, 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 very important. And, and when, when we were talking earlier, you used an analogy that I really like, and I want to bring it up here. So mm. we're friends, right? <laughs> I, I think so. <laughs> and I mean, so talk to me about, about the, I just rephrase it a little in terms of a, um, what, what should I expect from a friend? You and I are friends. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, I wouldn't say that we have there are things that I would expect you to do as my friend and mm -hmm. things that I wouldn't expect you to do as my friend. Right. And I suppose in a way what you, what you were describing is, is like a, any friendship or any kind of relationship, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. A, it, it, for every relationship, every friendship, there are, there's a set of boundaries or rules that, that come up. I mean, um, if we could cast our ideas back to when we were studying, I remember we were living, my wife and I were on marriage complex. Um, people would come over and there were boundaries and rules, you know, that, that you couldn't just walk in but to the house. Most of the times, you, people come and knock and, you know, you give a sound, you, you know, you, you make something, you let people know that you're coming. I right? like that. What I, I like appreciated that. about my friends is that they would call. Yeah, um, situations, sometimes people would, would turn up and it wasn't, it wasn't bad, you know, but then it wasn't just, like you just turn up and say, well, they barge into the house and you walk right into the bedroom and lay down or you come, you know, it, it wasn't those things. So the, the, a friendship that is not based, or rather anything that is not based on bonus and rules, leaves the door open for chaos. Mm, I like that. For chaos. I, I really like that analogy because it came forcefully to my mind that um, those tied up in those rules, you know, they were there to protect everybody in the relationship. Mm -hmm. So you That's in your true. home, those rules protect protected you and everybody and all the members of your household mm -hmm. from... Um, obtrusive entry into the home yeah, and it also protected us as well you know it helped to keep us safe yes, and right. so that we would both know you know where to stand where and where not to overstep in you know, the <laughs> boundaries yeah. and i really like that so uh in terms of yes and this is this is really a, a powerful understanding of the whole thing um are there any other points that you wanted to add to this one or should we talk about the law within the covenant itself I think we could use what we wanted to to think to, to, to say here. It just it's just a highlight for us, you know, and we can move into that to, to the next point of the, the discussion. Um, for the laws, for the Ten Commandment law that was mentioned in Deuteronomy, I, I was thinking, and I'm not sure if it's a thought I've received from reading somewhere or from listening to somebody else presenting or, or preaching or whatever, but it, it dawned on me that if if you were to keep at least one of these commandments. Imagine if the whole world was to keep one of the commandments. And as we were talking before, I remember I mentioned I'm stealing. You know, if you were all to keep the, the commandment, thou shalt not steal. And think of this. There'll be no more petty larceny or grand larceny. There'll be no more... Um, white collar crime. White collar crime, blue collar crime, whatever. Any type of collar crime. There'll be no more um, bank robberies. This is quite relevant. There'll be no more um, stealing of, I don't know, stuff from work. For example, and, and imagine how the whole world would go if you just didn't steal. And imagine how the world would be or could be if we kept all Ten Commandments. 
We don't have to think too far. So let me let me talk to you here for a minute. Let me let me yeah, talk yeah. to you. Are right, you ready for you ready for so, here, huh? so so when you hear the word law, honestly, what comes to your mind? Isn't it like stuff like policemen and you know <laughs> like robbers and jail punishment? You know, when you hear the law, those don't those things come to mind, of course. Yeah, of course. Of course, of course. Um, but the thing is, mm -hmm. if you're breaking the four for all here. <laughs> but the thing is about about the law, when we start to think about it on, on that and in that realm, police um, and, and whatever else you just mentioned there, you know, um after meeting Chris, and then by extension after going into the classes we did. You know, I be understand now that law means something else. So mm -hmm. law, the actual translation, the word law comes. You get the, the understanding of a teaching, a teaching, yeah. or, or, or or instruction. Yeah, but but even even before you get there, I mean, mm -hmm. in, in in the natural sense, um, I I often wonder if people can expect there to wouldn't chaos reign if there were there were no no traffic laws, no. I mean, somebody could break into your house and steal stuff, and there would be no no punishment for it. Wouldn't there be chaos? Yeah. So I mean, when I when I hear law, I guess you you could also think about order and yeah. harmony and stability, you know. Yeah. And those types of things too. And I I I often wonder why it is um, sometimes that people who who discuss the law do so with a mindset that you know it is something that is maybe like. Mm, described in a way that seems to be against them, you know, or mm -hmm. something that is not made for their benefit. Mm -hmm. and I understand that if you look at it in a, if you look at laws in a way that are against you, right? I mean, it could be a lot of pressure. I'm not, I'm not taken away from that, you know, but I wonder how is it that God really wants us to, to look at him? And we use some words just now there to describe God, like, uh, like stable mm -hmm. in fact the bible says something about him in um deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 12 and 13 which you read before mm -hmm. i think they could be instrumental in helping us to understand um about instructions and how god wanted us to relate to his law but i can read it here yeah. deuteronomy 10 12 and 13 he says and now israel what does the lord thy god require of you but to fear the lord thy god to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day, which are for your good. So what in what ways were these instructions for their good? Well, I'm looking here and I'm seeing the, the, the highlighting part that Jesus there is on to walk in his ways. Mm -hmm. So any way that the word that the Lord walks or asks us to walk are, are automatically good. Yeah. Yeah, automatically good. So when we're looking at uh, uh, this idea here now, uh, in what ways are they good? In every way. Mm -hmm. In every way. And, and, and that's basically, I wanted to talk about the part before, if we kept one commandment, coming into this part of this discussion here, because when we start to look at it in this view, we realize that that it goes antagonistic, right, rather. it goes against our natural inclination, all right? Whereas before I was, I, I, I would do anything and still not feel completed, still not feel full, Still not feel as if you know I'm missing an element mm -hmm. when they start to, to 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 give it over to the Lord and start to walk in His way. Now I start to feel as if I'm accomplishing something. I start to feel as if there's something added to my life. I start to feel now as if I should share these things, and the law really now starts to free us. Then we keep it and follow God. It starts to free us now from what we were confined to say that this is it and there is nothing else. Mm -hmm. After we are transformed into into God's, um, in his into His will and yeah. into His image, Correct. I suppose you could look at them as uh, guidelines for for the new life, mm -hmm. how He wants us to live, and I and I really like that because a, a nation of uh, priests, people who represent God, really should be able to walk in harmony with Him. Mm -hmm. Should be able to walk like how like Jesus walked, and, and, and should be able and to walk. True. To be delighted in doing it. Yes, exactly. Enjoy doing it is not a burden. 
Exactly, and yeah. this, this brings us um, to the idea about the, 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 what I like to call the stability of God's law. Because Malachi 3, 6 describes God in a particular way. If you have a text there, just read it for me, please. Yeah, sure, Malachi 3, 6, it says, For I am the Lord, mm -hmm. I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yes, and, and to me, this kind of, when you look at the law, when you look at who God is, first of all, Mm -hmm. is what you, one thing you can take away just on the surface of that text is that God doesn't change. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've heard it, heard it uh, a few places before that the law seems to be like a transcript of God's character, you know? And, and so we wouldn't expect that the law that it changes, you know, that it facilitates, you know, mm -hmm. from one thing to the next over and over. So what, what do we really want to take away uh, from this understanding that, uh, God doesn't change first, mm -hmm. and that what what how does this help me as a Christian to know that I can can I build on His law? Can I stand on it, knowing that it doesn't change? Yeah, Talk to it's me. sure. It is sure. As a matter of fact, it's a, it is an assurance that God is reliable and dependable, and 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 in the world that changes so quickly. I mean, you you have a phone and a phone. Uh, the, the life of a phone changes within a year or two years. You know, same thing for a computer. Every three years, a computer is changing over. Same thing for technology. Every it feels like it's changing every moment. But let me look at who God is. Let me tell you, God don't change. And and if God doesn't change, then the law that 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 gives us a glimpse at His personality that is not changing. True. Yeah? And then when we start to link all those things together, then we start to find a sense now of stability. No, in the law, but also in our relationship with the Lord, in our life, in our both 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 um, church life, work life, school life, all those things now start to have a firm structure around us. Okay, I like that. And there's a particular statement here that I just want to read it as it is. Um, it says, "God says that right is right." because it describes the best possible relationships. Mm. And I, find that, I found that to be very uh, pertinent to the discussion here. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask a question just for clarification's sake, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we know that God's law cannot save a person from sin, point blank. Mm -hmm. That was not the purpose for the law, right? right? Mm -hmm. So why, I'm, I'm, why did he make it a part of the covenant relationship with him? You know, what, mm. what, what, I mean, I think this has something to do with uh, what is said here in Amos 3, 3, you know, mm -hmm. and to walk together unless they be agreed, you know, mm -hmm. right? So why, why is it that we, you know, that he made the, the law part of the covenant relationship? Because every relationship requires an agreement. Yeah, it requires an agreement and, and, and it brings them into harmony. Mm -hmm. it brings us into harmony. And... and when you really look at the question Ian Moss asks, it really starts to, to make us look on the inside at who we are, and more so the people that we world in, the people that we, that the, the God that we worship. You know, it starts to make us look at what he says about the day he should, that we should worship. It starts to make us look at probably our, our personalities and our characters, and we start to, to, to realize, in fact, I can, I can quote the lesson here. It says, uh, because God is not only the creator of this world, of the world, but also its moral governor, law is essential for happiness of his created intelligent beings to live in harmony with him. His law, the expression of his will, is thus the constitution of his government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that. You came through loud and clear. It, the, law, the purpose of the law is not to save us but it helps define my duty to God and our viewers' duty to each other. That's right. Um, but you know, when I was, I had a thought this week, I'm gonna share this one with you before we move on to the, the final area of our study. And when I was thinking about the law, I sat in my, in my meditation and I thought to myself that the law really, it just prescribes what is right behavior and then it describes what that behavior is. Mm -hmm. But when I find, and I do find myself sometimes on the wrong side of the law, Mm -hmm. it, then it points me to Jesus, who is able to, to justify me mm -hmm. and then help me to do of his good pleasure. 
And I, I really enjoyed that because if you like me viewers out there, if you like me, if you mess it up sometimes, just remember that the law can point, it points us to Jesus. This is the point here. It will point you to Jesus who is then able to take you by the hand through the power of the Holy Spirit and then help you to do what is right in the eyes of God. That's right. And so this takes us to the final point about if. How, I mean, there were some texts that were given at Atom. I'm going to ask you to read, read all of them. But what is, what is the role that obedience plays in the covenant promise? I'm just going to ask it like that, you know? <laughs> The role that obedience plays in the covenant. Mm -hmm. How white? How is how important is it? You know, to... you know that this is the, the, the whole the the, the, the the whole week the lesson here. The whole week here. Give it to me a lesson yeah. of five minutes. This is this is, this is it here. Is that if we do not obey, mm -hmm. then there is a consequence for our not obeying. But what the Lord does in these texts here, it shows us the upside to obeying. Benefits. Yeah? Benefits of it. Right? If you follow me, then you will gain whatever whatever I have for you, which in this instance is eternal life and the right to the tree of life and, and, and the way into heaven. Uh, Genesis 18, I mean, the, the readers could view this, they could read this at home. The two texts in Genesis shows us a relationship with God and Abraham that has already been built, already been tried, already been tested. But he says, he gives it definitely. I know that you will do this, Abraham. I know this is what you're going to do. The second text says, uh, I know that you're, I will give you descendants and multiply as the stars of heaven. Because you obeyed my voice, you kept my charge, you kept my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And the other two gives you the, 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 the if clause. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandment, then you shall see a special treasure, Exodus 19.5. If you walk in my shadows and keep my commandments and perform them, then it will give you rain in its season. So we see God is saying here, if you follow these things that I'm telling you, then you will get the blessing. Mm -hmm. Then you will get this particular blessing. Mm -hmm. because the Lord has already blessed him with, with um, Exodus from Egypt. Yeah, you go ahead. So I don't want I, No, I like, I, I, I want to hold up your hand here a minute because when, when you were saying it, I, I get the impression that God is a gentleman, huh? You know, mm. let me explain what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, I just mean to say that he doesn't force these blessings. That's on people. right. So if you want to be in a covenant relationship with God, when you, when you do what he asks you to do, you have a choice. When you do what he asks you to do, then it kind of it frees him to, it puts you in the position where he can pour those blessings out on you. That's right. He's not going to force those things on you. And I, I really like that. I re and we have the Bible testifies that this is true. We saw that Abraham was blessed because of the fact that he believed God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I really, I really enjoy this idea. All right. So uh, you want to give us a final thought before we bring this one into a close? Yeah, I just want to say to, to the viewers, out there, remember that uh, you are not alone in this, in this struggle. You know, as, as uh, Baptist members, as a pastor, as... Um, elder in, in the church, there are still struggles out there, and to use the phrase, the struggle is real, right? Mm -hmm. And we want to say to you that, that to, to keep trusting in the Lord, keep holding on to Him, keep keep placing everything in His hands, and He will take care of you. I love that. I love that. Well, folks, it has been a pleasure as always uh, in this journey with you, and and I, like my friend Dean, I'm going to encourage everybody out there. Really hold on to Jesus. Uh, these days are testifying to me that he really wants to do something exciting in and through his people. And we can only do that if we put ourselves in a position where he can use us and where he can take us from where we are to where he wants us to be. Right. Uh, with that in mind, I encourage everybody out there, if you're not already in a relationship with Jesus, <laughs> Now is the time. Isn't that right, Dean? That's right. Now is the time. Now is, now the, is time. the time. You have nothing to lose. And so I'm just going to close now with a prayer and just asking everybody, asking everybody really to believe God. Try his promises. For as you taste and see, you will see, you will prove that the Lord is good. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me as we pray and close this broadcast. Heavenly Father, Thank you for this opportunity to study your word together. I pray and I ask that you truly will prove your word to us even now. That as we walk with you, that you can help us to live lives that are pleasing in your sight. And even more than that, 
that you will be able to bless us and that we may be a blessing to others, all those with whom we come into contact. And so today, may you also touch all of our viewers, draw them close to you, so that at the end of time when you shall come, that we may all be saved because we have made you our best friend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, folks, it's been another exciting week. My name is Jamal Thomas. I'm your host, and I'm inviting you to study, to show yourselves approved unto God. Until next time.